the theater. So this is the title of my talk, and I thought what better place to ask that question than, than in the theater itself. Imagined realities. That's what the theater invites us to experience. And there's real value in this because it allows us to see and hear differently. But for most people, the theater is an entertainment, a luxury. And at a time when the world feels like it's in a perpetual state of contraction, economic, psychological, social, emotional, it is hard to lift our heads up and take our eyes off of the bottom line, the bottom line that is marked profit, net earnings, return. Uh, but it is essential to take our eyes up off the bottom line, even though we're in a time where that concern is justified. The low price of oil and other commodities, the diminishing buy buying power of the Canadian dollar, people losing their jobs. And we know these people. I know these people. One of them is my brother. And so at a time like this, I often uh, see and read and hear, you know, we just don't have the luxury of investing in the performing arts. And there's one area that we really need to reconsider, the inclusion of the performing arts, and that's in our education system. Because we need to train our young people in skills that they actually need, right? To which my response is, right. There's another bottom line that we need to consider. And that is the crux, the essential, the nub, the heart of the matter. And it is my contention that we not only need to think about the theatre, but we really need to think about the inclusion of the fundamentals of theatre right throughout our education system, from K to 12, undergraduate, graduate, post-secondary, and beyond. Because there is no profession, there is no relationship, there is no human being who does not need the following. The need to share our stories the value of empathy, and the fine art of listening. At the heart of the theater is the story. And we craft our formative memories into narratives so we can make sense of, of what we do, what we see, and what we feel. The story encapsulates our experience. My own story begins with me and a toaster. My mother tells a story of how um, uh, I would be playing outside and uh, something would happen. Uh, I'd fall down or I'd get in a fight with my brother or sister and I would come running to the back door, up the stairs, through to the kitchen. She could see that I was upset but I would say nothing until I went straight to the side of the toaster to see if I could see my reflection in it and then I would burst into tears. <laughs> and that, she said, is her first indication that I was going to be an actor. And the performing arts were my passion. I mean, I, I wanted to perform more than anything else. I missed family holidays to perform, or I uh, did a play, or I played my euphonium in the Anaganish Wind Ensemble. I was extremely passionate. I carried through right from junior high school to high school, and then I was accepted into the, into the prestigious BFA acting program at the University of Alberta, where at the uh, tender age of 20, I graduated and launched into a full-time Canadian theatre career, which for me meant acting seven months of the year and waitressing for five. <laughs> so I did this for a number of years and then it occurred to me that I uh, wanted to try and explore other interests. Somebody, a friend, suggested that I try teaching English as a second language. I tried volunteering, I started volunteering, and I loved it. And what I loved most about it was the stories that I was hearing. I was hearing stories of tremendous survival and sacrifice. And they were told in a spirit of completely selfless generosity. I mean, they were there to learn language skills from me, but really <laughs> the true knowledge trans transference was happening in reverse. And there were two stories, two stories that, that uh, stand out for me. The first was one that was unfolding before my eyes. I, in my class, I had a 40-year-old Afghani man and a 20-year-old Quebecois man. 
and they developed a fast friendship. And it was the most unlikely of relationships. But they valued each other. They needed each other. They had the utmost respect for each other. There were no divides between their humanity. And they found each other incredibly hilarious. <laughs> they laughed a lot. Mm. And so did we. We laughed right along with them. The other story that stays with me is a story that a Vietnamese woman told me about a journey that she took on a boat to a new life what she witnessed on that boat, mothers and fathers holding their dying children in their arms, unable to prevent them from the ravages of disease and starvation. And because there was no place in the boat for them to stay after they had died, these parents threw these babies overboard. The parents were doomed to spend every day staring out into the sea, reliving the moment they lost everything. These stories changed me. And they also made me realize how little I knew about what was going on in the world. Most of the classes I teach at the University of Alberta involve students from a multitude of faculties. And I would say what most of my students want is to be heard. They want to be able to speak up for themselves. And so they need to understand a little bit about all the influences that have shaped them what has brought them to their worldview and how they proceed through the world. So my job is to set up structures of engagement for them to consider their own story. And what happens when they do that is interesting. Because once you understand that you have a story that informs you, you appreciate that other people have stories that, that influence them as well. And that's a very good thing to realize. Because you begin to acknowledge your own influences, for better or worse, and you also begin to acknowledge others so that it helps you understand behaviors that, that you can't seem to accept. These populations of students that I have in my classes are incredibly diverse. I have the great privilege of working with a number of international students and also, often, students from the U of A's on-campus program, which is a terrific program. Uh, that provides educational op opportunities for students with various developmental disabilities. And this diversity is critical. What it allows each of us to do is to examine our cultural frame and the frame of our ability. When you have to negotiate a way of working with somebody whose normative cues are not the same as your own, you're challenged to shift to shift your perception, to shift your way of doing things. Not always easy, but always illuminating and very often profound. I think I have the privilege of working basically to help people be their best selves. And the bonus is that I'm challenged to be my best self as well. Every substantive thing we accomplish we accomplish with other people. And we need those soft skills, I think misnamed soft skills, to, to help us do that. I looked up soft skills. They're defined as personal attributes that help you act effectively and harmoniously with others. And I would say those are the really hard skills. <laughs> <laughs> I had the pleasure of working with students from the Department of Medicine at various stages of their training. I've been doing this since 2010. I facilitate a workshop called Communicating Care. And the elective was the idea, originally conceived by uh, Dr. Alim Neji, who is now a doctor, but at the beginning of his medical career, he, he thought, gee, you know, I think we need more focus on the role of empathy in the doctor-patient relationship. So he approached Dr. Pamela Brett McLean, who is the director of the Arts and Health and Humanities and Medicine program at the University of Alberta. And together, they came to the Department of Drama and approached my colleague, Mike Kennard, who did the first pilot project of the elective. And they thought about how they could enable this practice. And over time, we've come to understand that the fundamental principles of 
improvisation, actually, are the things that we need to play with. That there are skills in improvisation that can really help you in any communication that, you ha that you're uh, having, because communication is an improv. I mean, you can have, have very set ideas of what you're going to say, but you also have to consider the other people in the room. And the way to do that, and the way to be attentive to that, is to have a very mindful attention on the present. I set up structures of engagement that allow them to play and discover what it means to be fully present. Because if they can't communicate to their patient in a way that the patient can understand, it's of little use. It's been a, quite a fascinating uh, journey that continues. I just did uh, the elective a couple of weeks ago. And we are continuing we're writing and doing some uh, publications and presentations about it because I think it's a useful thing. And uh, the, the feedback from it has been very positive. I also work with scientists, helping them communicate their science, crafting stories to help them reach an audience outside of their peers. I worked at a conference that Alberta Innovates Health Solutions used to hold where members of the public and funders were in attendance. And it was very challenging for these brilliant scientists to be able to communicate in a way that the funders and the general public could understand. But again, if they could find a way to communicate something about themselves in a way that was caring of the audience, in other words, communicating that they themselves, as the scientists, cared about who they were talking to, the acceptance of what they were saying was much higher, and they were much more effective. I do something else. I work in, and I think um, it was alluded to, I work in, with Alberta Health Services. And this is uh, once or twice a week. I work in a couple of day programs that they run. These day programs are for people with various mental health challenges and addiction issues. They provide a safe place for people to come during the day, have a cup of coffee. They are cared for, respected, listened to. I approach the work, and this is another beauty of the theater. There's really only one rule to the theater, one proviso in terms of improvisation, and that is that you say yes, that you are willing to try. So I walk into this group of people assuming their ability, and they try. And they are often a lot freer imaginatively than those of us with less obvious challenges. I've been doing that work for two and a half years, and it's extremely satisfying work and extremely um, underserved population, in my opinion. Isaac Dinesen, the Danish writer, once said, all sorrows can be born if they're told in a story. On a Tuesday night, Last August, I got a phone call from my dad. It was around 5.30 in the afternoon. Now, it's not unusual for me to get a phone call from my dad, but the timing was a bit strange. My parents are like the routines, and they usually have dinner at 5.30 and then go downstairs to the basement and watch the news at 6. So it gave me a little bit of a pause, but I didn't worry about it too much. Dad said, have I got you at a bad time? Uh, no, Pops, what's up? I've got some tough news. Now that is the precursor for somebody has died in my family. And so I began to prepare. Uh, my Aunt Mamie, who was 90 years old and had uh, numerous health challenges, I was getting prepared to hear that she had passed away. She's my dad's only surviving sibling, so this is going to be very challenging for him, especially. He pauses and then says, Pat took his own life. There is nothing that prepares you for this. Nothing. Pat was my cousin. He was the son of my father's brother, Uncle Frank, who died when he was a teenager. And perhaps because his mother, Evelyn, had 11 children to raise, all on our own. They ranged in age from 2 to 20. We spent a lot of time with them. Aquispamsis and Loch Lomond 
at St. John and Nashwaxis. On August 25th, 2015, Patrick James Pat Flieger took his own life. He was 59 years old. He was a loving partner, father, uncle, nephew, cousin, colleague, and friend. And even though that I knew, I knew that he had been struggling with the darkness as he described it. I didn't find out until later that he had been battling mental illness for three years. And so heartbroken, we have reached out to each other. We are collectively Team Pat. And we have committed to telling his story in whatever way we can. His partner and his brothers and sisters are telling his story to the Board of Mental Health Inquiry of Nova Scotia, hoping to help improve the way that people with depression and other mental illnesses are treated in that province. My cousin is committed to running 1,000 kilometers in 200 consecutive days. And every time he runs, he tells Pat's story. Pat's sister is making a quilt and raffling it off. I am on day 118 of my 200 miles for Pat journey. We are telling his story to raise awareness about mental health. We are telling his story in the hopes of making a difference. Dr. Atul Gawande once said, people talking to people, that's how you change things. Who needs the theater? We all do. Thank you very much. <laughs>